In your Bible, how Jesus is going to rescue us from this decaying planet? Are you ready for the greatest rescue mission in all of Earth's history? Let me tell you a secret. The Lord does nothing in secret. He is transparent with all of His plans for you. Let's study. My name is Cami Utman, and I'll be sharing the great news next on Unlocking Bible Prophecies. The rise of an international the pandemic, news about the coronavirus. polarizing global politics, the mismanagement and corruption, increasingly destructive natural disasters, and the bushfires in Australia are a warning of what may be to come around the world. What does it all mean? What does the future hold? Join international speaker Cami Utman on a journey for answers in unlocking Bible prophecies. In her travels around the world, she's come face to face with real life struggles, but in the midst of them, she's found miracles of hope. Join Cami Utman for Unlocking Bible Prophecies as she shares how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled faster than ever before. Isn't it amazing that we have been together for eight sessions already? Is this your first time watching? If so, let us know by clicking the link. Also, you can find all of our archived programs at awr.org forward slash Bible, as well as some bonus work resources there. Last night, we studied the truth about death. I love how the Bible is so clear. Wasn't it reassuring and comforting when Jesus tells us 50 times that death is simply a momentary sleep until he wakes us up on resurrection morning? Did you know that all of heaven is orchestrating your rescue right now? That Jesus, the King of the universe, is preparing and personalizing your heavenly home at this moment. We are going to look at this truth tonight Stay with me and you will be thrilled about God's plan for you. Now come with me to the continent of Africa where I met Assad face to face in an undisclosed country. He is one of our faithful radio pro uh, broadcasters and his story helps introduce our topic tonight, the rescue. But first, pray with me friends. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for bringing us together again tonight to study the most awesome moment in all of history. Lord, we can't wait for you to return and we know it soon. We've seen the signs. We're hearing the, the warnings in the Bible and everything is taking place and we want to be ready, Lord. And so we want to know the truth of your coming, your second coming, so that we are prepared. Lord, thank you for this rescue that we all await and um, we just love and adore you. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. Late one afternoon, Assad closed the door to his office at the Avenus World radio station. He would be gone for several days. Assad boarded the bus and nothing seemed unusual. It was like any other day. Only today, he was traveling farther, this time back to his home country for a short visit. Despite religious persecution in his home country, Assad longed for his people to know Jesus, and this spurred him on. All of a sudden, Assad's thoughts were interrupted. Three masked men stopped the van and their guns were drawn. Assad cringed as they reached for him and to his horror they yelled, This is the man we are looking for. They told him they knew of his work with the radio and wanted his contacts. Unsatisfied with the answers he gave, they threw him into a large empty shipping container. Shut out from fresh air and sunshine, he sat in darkness. His socks, shoes, and jacket were taken, and Assad suffered from the extreme conditions. As the sun beat down in the day, the metal container intensified the heat, while at night a sharp chill set in. Without food or water, Assad soon fell very sick. As he sat in the dark, isolated container, his mind went back to his childhood. Scenes of his village being raided by night flashed before him. Those men had worn masks too. Somehow he escaped though, and he ran with all his might. Alone in the darkness, he wondered for the first time, what would become of me? Assad's mind lingers on the memories. There was an orphanage he was taken to, and the boys that had introduced him to Avenus World Radio. They had huddled together, listening, knowing that if caught, punishment would ensue. Christianity was not allowed there, 
but this only made them long all the more for truth. Then there was a day that when the orphanage director had called him into her, into her office, and Assad was old enough now that he must leave the orphanage. His heart ached as he walked away, never to return. Again, he wondered, what will become of me? Now he sat alone in a metal shipping container, pondering the same question he had as a lonely child and dejected orphan. Assad closed his eyes and thought about his work with AWR. Since escaping his home country, Assad had been producing Avanus radio programs in his native tongue for his people back home. Christianity was forbidden, and, but the radio could carry the message that missionaries could not. Assad wondered what would become of his radio program now. Who would carry on the work if he didn't return? The days and weeks passed. Assad was suddenly released from the container, but the inhumane conditions remained. Starved, beaten, and even electrocuted, he had endured more than any human should. And one day, without notice, his hands were unbound, and he was told he could return home. He could hardly believe it. He was free and praised the Lord as he boarded a bus again, this time headed home to his family and his work at the radio station. Despite the harrowing experience Assad has been through, he trusts the Lord to keep him safe and knows that as long as God wants him to be producing these programs, nothing can stop him. God is all about the rescue, friends. Not only does he have incredible plans to rescue us from this planet that were set into motion thousands of years ago, but he daily rescues humans through miraculous moments while we walk our individual paths through this life, just like Assad's experience. Our Lord will deliver us from the clutches of death. God's end time plan is revealed in his word, and that is what gives us confidence to take the stand on the scriptures. If it is in the Bible, I believe it. And if it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. Did you know one out of every 11 New Testament verses speak about the return of Jesus? This event is mentioned 2,500 times in all of scripture. Every prophecy from Genesis to Revelation builds to the climax of Earth's history, which is the second coming of Jesus, which is your personal rescue. When you look at the book of Revelation, there is one central theme, and that is Jesus. It is not the dragon. It is not the seven-headed beast. No. Revelation 14:14 14, 14 says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. When the book of Revelation paints the picture of Jesus coming, it portrays him coming with a crown on his head, because he comes as the King of kings and Lord of lords. You will see that the Bible does not describe Jesus' second coming with him sneaking into the world silently or secretly. Could Christians be expecting Jesus' second coming to be different than what the Bible clearly describes? The people in Jerusalem were surprised, confused, and unprepared for how Jesus came to the earth the first time, in a meek, quiet, unassuming manner, with only a few to welcome him as an infant born to a poor family. Unfortunately, the people were applying the prophecies of the Messiah's second coming to his first coming. They expected the opposite. They expected a conqueror to overthrow Rome because they were being suppressed under its rule. So the Jews thought a king would come and reestablish them as the governing power and flip the hierarchy of, on Rome. History has a way of repeating itself, friends. Many Christians today are expecting Jesus' second coming to be different than what the Bible clearly describes. Jesus gave us definite signs, actual details of his second coming, so that we can distinguish him from any imposter. He comes with a crown of gold on his head. The Bible always portrays Christ coming in power and glory. When you look at the book of Revelation, it always portrays him coming in heavenly majesty. Let's look at Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes, a, makes war. 
Verse 14, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Why does the Bible picture Jesus symbolically coming on a white horse? A white horse is a symbol of purity, victory, and triumph. When Jesus comes with a crown of gold upon his head, riding a white horse, he is pictured as a victorious general, coming to defeat all the forces of evil. Jesus returns victoriously, triumphantly, and gloriously. Revelation 11:15. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When Jesus comes, the great controversy will end. Sin and sinners will be no more. Jesus' coming is not some mysterious event. He comes to reign over the entire universe. He comes to be worshipped and praised by the redeemed forever and ever. There are two very important questions that many ask concerning the second coming. Number one, how will Jesus come back the second time? Number two, how can I know that I will be ready when he comes? The Bible gives very clear answers to both questions. God's end time plan is revealed in his word. Jesus plainly describes one of the de deceptions before his return this way. Luke 17, 23. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. In other words, if anyone says, hey, Jesus is meeting secretly right now with a select few in Tokyo or New York or in some secret temple chamber with a particular religious group, or right now he's gathering a mass of followers in the desert or anywhere on earth, we can know this is an imposter. And these claims are false. Do not go running after them. Luke 17, 24. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Christ won't suddenly appear on a talk show in Hollywood or as a miracle worker on the streets of Paris. Our Jesus won't walk down some major streets in this world. Our Jesus won't hold up his hands boasting, I'm the Messiah. He's coming like lightning, which lights and flashes up the whole sky. Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up from below. Remember the story I told you last night, how Nick warned that the goddess will soon be rising from below? If you missed that story, Go back to the archive presentation, The Grave. You don't want to miss it. Such an important discrepancy. That's why Jesus gives us details like he's coming in the clouds of glory so that we aren't looking for some goddess coming up from the earth. Is it really necessary to understand all this? If I just love Jesus, isn't that enough? Satan attempts to deceive people and many are deceived. He's called the great deceiver. He counterfeits the truth to lead millions astray. Let me share with you some very clear facts about the second coming of our Lord Jesus. Christ's coming will be a literal event. Acts 1.11 This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus ascends. The power of gravity cannot hold him down. As the disciples gaze up at Jesus in wonder, he ascends higher and higher and higher. They saw him go. They will see him return. A real Christ ascended, and a real Christ will descend. This Jesus who healed the sick, fed the 5,000, and raised the dead ascended and will return again. I love how the Bible says the coming of Jesus will be a visible event because I can't wait to see him. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Don't you love that? Every eye. This text re-emphasizes how Jesus will not come secretly, especially just to a chosen few. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. This event is literal and visible. Christ's coming will also be an audible event. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord him, himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Can you imagine? 
hearing the voice of God thundering through the universe, trumpeting his arrival? That's no secret. He's not coming quietly or secretly. God's magnificent shout will awaken all of those who have died in Christ. His voice will pierce their graves, and they shall awaken to their conquering king, who has come to rescue them. They will hear the voice of the archangel with the trumpet signifying victory, triumph over death, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is the incredible moment each body will receive immortality, meaning forever we will live in perfection. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 promises, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So not only the righteous dead rise from their graves, but also the righteous who are alive when he comes will meet Jesus in the air surrounded by thousands and thousands of glistening angels. You don't want to miss this, friends. If we would only take time to think about such a moment, then any trial that we are experiencing on this earth is worth going through. Because not only will Jesus get you through this trial, but he promises you such an incredible reward. Take it, because he's freely giving it to you. Now, does Jesus come to live on the earth at this time? No. Scripture has us meeting him in the air. So let's not mess with Scripture. We don't meet him on the earth. His feet do not touch the ground. We meet him in the air. This point alone clears up any question about imposters walking around on this earth. In Matthew 24, 26, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go. Suppose your friend comes to you and tells you, He's found Jesus, who's preaching warm, beautiful Bible truths with power, and even calls fire down from heaven, heals the sick and blesses the children, reads people's minds and stops wars. What will you tell your friend? Because now you know from Scripture yourself. Immediately, you should tell him that he is an imposter. The Bible says, do not go, because when the real Christ comes, he will perform a dazzling light show in the sky with 10,000 times 10,000 angels as shown in Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Christ's coming will be a glorious event. Only Christ is a life giver. Only he can resurrect the dead. The real Christ will catch us up in the sky to travel with him past the moon, past the stars, past the sun, to the very throne room of God in the universe. And there we will always be with him. Mm. Matthew 24, 30, the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Christ's coming is like lightning that flashes from the east to the west. He appears in the sky to all tribes of the earth. And Revelation 1-7 tells us this, every eye will see him. You see, it is not only believers who will see him when he comes, but also the masses who have rejected him. This is the prime opportunity for God's character to be vindicated. Every person will see and hear the exact truth from the Bible being fulfilled before their very eyes. When Jesus come, there, comes, there are only two classes of people, the unsaved and the saved, the lost and the redeemed. There is no second chance when Christ comes again. This is the climax of earth's history. So Jesus is making sure to come literally, visibly, audibly, and Jesus comes gloriously. So there's no question what is happening the entire universe is witnessing this decisive event in human history. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, meaning indestructible, and we shall be changed. Can you imagine seeing the earth illuminated with the glory of God? The ground rumbles, the buildings shake, and the lightning flashes, and the thunder crashes. 
Ten thousand times ten thousand angels speed with haste to graves as righteous believers rise from the earth. This tells us again that the dead are in their graves, not already in heaven. Our bodies no longer have the curse of sin. There are no more deaf ears. There are no more blind eyes, no more arthritic limbs, and no more diseased bodies. As believers, we are looking up to meet the eyes of Christ. Can you imagine that very moment when your eyes meet with his for the first time? I hope I'll be able to see him through my tears. This is the most magnificent event in the heavens. Instantly, our mortal bodies, which are subject to disease and, and death, receive immortality. Instantly, we are transformed. New life pulsates through our every cell. We radiate with health and joy. As Christ ascends in glory, we sing his praises as our bodies are changed from disease and degenerated to flawless. Revelation 15.3 Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the Saints. Finally, the King of Kings receives the praise he's always deserved as every believer acknowledges him as Savior. What a beautiful scene, reuniting with families, embracing our loved ones. This is the greatest drama of the ages. Isaiah 25, 9 says, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. You see, we have not accepted the false Christ, the counterfeit Messiah, who pretended he was Jesus. We need to remember that the great controversy has two sides to the battle, and the other side is also present during this event. Can you imagine how Satan will see his every lie, every counterfeit, every deception crumble? Before him. He will see God's children rising to Jesus. Those same people he persecuted are now forever known as the overcomers throughout the universe. Perhaps even the evil angels will quiver as they see those they tempted being made immortal. They realize they've lost the war. It's over. It's done. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices we make right now today, friends. I believe we are living on the very edge of eternity. We are living in the days just before the second coming of Christ. Don't you want to make it a priority today to be ready for this crowning event? Let's look at seven biblical facts that happen at his return. First, there will be stupendous seismic upheavals. Mountains and islands will disappear and a great earthquake will shake this planet as shown in Revelation 6.14. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Second, the righteous dead are raised. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, The dead in Christ shall rise first. All who sleep in their graves will hear Christ's trumpet-like voice and rise up to eternal life. Next, righteous living are changed. Then immortality is given. And then the wicked living are destroyed. In Revelation 6.15, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. We can see they have no change of heart when they see the God of the universe descend. They actually still reject him by wanting to hide from him. In this very action, we can see that God's judgment of every heart is correct. The wicked still want to run away from him. Their actions in this verse also show that when Jesus comes, there will be no second chance, no second opportunity. When Jesus comes, the wicked living are destroyed. The details of this will be studied tomorrow night. Don't miss it. 
Next, the righteous welcome Christ. The Bible says when Christ comes, we are caught up to meet him in the air. Over and over, Scripture describes how this, the saved sing praises to their long-awaited Jesus as they embrace their rescue. And then finally, righteous will go to heaven. Hallelujah. Now let's look at a popular misconception. The Bible mentions that Christ is coming as a thief. Let's read a few texts about it. 2 Peter 3.10 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Matthew 24, 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Are these texts speaking about the manner of Jesus' coming or the time of his coming? When the Bible talks about a thief, it is talking about the unexpected time he comes. Now look, does a thief cup his hands around his mouth and call out a warning like, Here I come! Get ready! I'm going to steal everything you've got! No. He comes when we least expect it. Quickly. Rapidly. Between 1995 and 2001, Stéphane Bretweiser, a French waiter and art connoisseur, stole more than 200 items from museums, galleries, and castles across Europe. Some authorities have estimated the total value of his thefts at 1.4 billion U.S. dollars. Bretweiser claimed that his motive was purely artistic. He didn't sell any of the items he stole, although many were destroyed by his mother when she learned of his arrest. Bretweiser obviously timed his theft so he would be unexpected. The museums, galleries, and castles were not ready for him. When Jesus comes as a thief in the night, the world will not expect him either. Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The Bible does not teach that he comes secretly as a thief, not at all. Notice Matthew 24, 44. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. In other words, you want to be prepared at all times, because you don't know when Jesus will return. The second coming is a surprise to the unprepared, but those that have studied their Bibles, like you, will be ready. Now, what about the expression, one taken and the other left, found in Luke 17, 36? There it says, two men will be in the field, the one will be taken and the other left. Does this text say that the one who is left is left alive? No. That's what popular opinion says, much like the fictional books and movies in the Left Behind series. But that is not what scripture says. Luke 17, 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. At the second coming, there will be two classes of people, just like in Noah's day. One class was saved alive in the ark. The other was swept away and died. Jesus continues in verse 28. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. Well, what happened in the days of Lot? One class taken out of the city and saved. The other was burned up. There will be two classes right before Jesus comes. One saved that will ascend to meet Christ and one lost. They are the dead, excuse me, they are dead and destroyed at Christ's second coming. Revelation is plain about this division of the world at the second coming of Christ. Those who love Christ and those who fear his arrival. Revelation 6:16-17 6, describes those who rejected him and they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of, of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? How tragic! He comes to save them, but they run and hide themselves. Their hearts are gripped with fear. They have not crowned him as the king of glory in their hearts today. So they don't want to crown him as the king of glory in the universe. They run, they are frightened. They cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. So when the Bible describes the second coming of Christ, 
One of the greatest deceptions is that some will be left on earth and have a second chance during the tribulation. No. The devil has sold that lie to deceive people to put off their salvation. They think I can put off my salvation dur and during the tribulation I can get serious then. No. Do not delay your decision. Friends, according to the book of Revelation and according to the teaching of Jesus, there is no second opportunity. The time to get serious about your salvation is now. Just as in Noah's day when the angel sealed the ark's door shut and the rain began to fall, from that moment, no one could get inside the ark to safety. No matter how loud they screamed or how hard they knocked on the door, it was over. There was no second chance to be rescued. Just like when you see Jesus coming in the clouds, he brings his reward with him. Everything has been decided. You cannot look up and say, oh, now I see, oh, now I believe in him, because then it will be too late. Don't let another day go by without making this most important decision of your life. Choose Jesus. And when you do, oh, the sweet reward that you cannot possibly imagine. But let's take a glimpse of what the reward of heaven will be like. Jesus says in John 14, 2 and 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and pre prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Can you believe that? The king of the universe wants you to be with him for all of eternity. So he is holding back the winds of strife right now because he wants all of us to have the opportunity to choose him. Choose to be ready at the second coming. Choose heaven. You see, Jesus wants just one more soul, just one more. This reminds me of the true rescue story of Desmond Doss, a Seventh-day Adventist who stood boldly for God and his convictions. He was in Okinawa during the bloodiest battle of World War II and saved 75 men without firing or carrying a gun. As an army medic, he single-handedly evacuated the wounded from behind enemy lines. He braved a barrage of gunfire while tending the, to the soldiers and was even wounded by a grenade. But God preserved his life. Desmond was loyal to God and was a witness to the whole world. And God used him to rescue so many others. All through the ages, God has had moral heroes just like Desmond Doss. I love Desmond's prayer. Let us each pray. Please, Lord, give me just one more, just one more soul for heaven. Because heaven is the ultimate gift from God. And I would love, wherever that is, as long as I'm with Jesus. But since God did give us a glimpse of heaven, let's go there together now. When we look at chapters like Revelation 21 and 22, we can imagine that after rising to meet the Lord in the air, we soar past planets and our eyes see heaven for the very first time with its 12 gates made of gigantic pearls and its 12 foundations, each made of precious gems. We see the streets of pure gold that we've dreamed about and now we see them with our own eyes and we are enveloped with the light from the glory of God. The verses tell us there will be no sun or moon needed, as wherever God resides, it glows with a brightness like fire. Next, we run towards the river of life, which flows out of God's throne, because we see that infamous tree, that tree that we will feast on, where we receive immortality, the tree of life, which bears 12 kinds of fruit, and what we initially cannot wrap our minds around is how huge the holy city is. It is perfectly square, each wall 375 miles, and every one fits inside 
perfectly. God has prepared every detail so beautifully, just like our new bodies are so beautiful with our immortal, perfect flesh and bone bodies, just like our Creator, our Master, our King, Jesus. And as the days pass, it becomes more and more apparent that there really is no more pain, no more fear, and no more tears. We are overwhelmed with all the joy that is in us, that is around us, that we share with all believers from all time. Together, side by side, we praise our Creator, our Savior. Oh, friends, just thinking about it. Mm. Now, this is not make-believe. Let's look at some scripture together so that you have all of these beautiful promises and descriptions of heaven marked in your own Bible. Let's look at scripture. There really are giant pearls. Listen to this. Revelation 21, verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Did you know that pearls are the product of suffering? A tiny irritant slips inside an oyster shell, and as the little creature suffers, it transforms that irritant into a lustrous gem. The gates are of pearl. Your entrance, my entrance, God provided at infinite personal suffering, as in Christ, he reconciled all things to himself. Revelation 21, verses 19 and 20. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardunx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopras, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Wow, God has used only the very finest materials in building the city. If you were to layer each of these gems on top of one another, it makes the most beautiful rainbow. Isn't our Creator so artistic? A rainbow of promise is the foundation of the holy city. Revelation 22, 5, There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 22, 1 and 2, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its, uh, in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree re yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. First, let's notice how the tree of life's roots are on either side of the river. How massive that tree must be! The leaves and fruit perpetuate immortality, providing eternal youth for God's people. Genesis 3.22 says, Take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God designed us to live forever with him. The holy city is an architect's dream. Described in Revelation 21.16, The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed. 12,000 furlongs, its length, Breadth and height are equal. Ancient cities were measured by outside wall circumference. A furlong is an eighth of a mile, which means the city will have a circumference of 1,500 miles. And since it is square, each wall will be 375 miles in length. Now, it's a perfect square. It is the same long as it is wide. But notice the height is also equal. So it will be 375 miles up, and it will contain 140,625 square miles, which is more area here in the U.S. If you think about it, it would be more than Virginia, the District of Columbia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Vermont combined. 
estimating at least 39 billion, at least, could fit inside the city. Seven, we, ha we currently have 7.8 billion uh, living on this earth, so that's almost five times more can easily fit inside this city. Wow, I cannot wait. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Revelation 21, 4, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Isaiah 40, 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Every faculty will be developed fully. Every capacity increased. The acquirement of knowledge will never weary the mind or exhaust the energies. This text lets us know that what we know about heaven is just a teaser. As 1 Corinthians 2.9 reads, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Matthew 8.11, And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Did you hear that? We're going to sit down with the great spiritual minds of the ages. God's heroes of faith from throughout the ages will be there. The Bible worthies we have only read about and never yet met will be there. Think about how it's going to be. Perhaps one day you will be working in your beautiful garden and see a man walking down the street and say, that looks like Adam. And he makes his way over to you and says, Hi, I'm Adam. I've been admiring your strawberries. And you sit down together and you begin to talk about life and share the joys of Jesus together. And perhaps one day you meet Moses, the patriarch who received the Ten Commandments written by the very hand of God. Moses shares details about what it was like to go through the Red Sea with the Egyptians following behind and the faith that it took to walk into the water. He recalls what it was like to lead the children of Israel 40 years in the wilderness. Next, maybe you see Daniel play wrestling with a lion. You run over and make friends as he shares his lion's den experience with you. When you ask Daniel, were you afraid? With tears of joy, he responds, I trusted my God. But most of all, heaven is a place to fellowship with Jesus. Our Christ who died for us. The one who had nails driven through his hands for us. The man whose head received a crown of pressing thorns for us. The very one, the only one who shed his blood for us. Isaiah 66, 23 says, From one Sabbath... To another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord Jesus. I personally cannot wait to hear you tell me, friend, about the day that you are walking out of the heavenly temple when Jesus stands before you. And he smiles, the most beautiful smile that you've ever seen. As he looks at you, he reaches out his hands and says, I want to take a walk with you. You walk through fields of waving grain and Jesus reaches out and breaks off some of that grain and, and he says, taste it. And together you walk over a hill and he, he says, look at these flowers. Aren't they magnificent? There are no other flowers like them in the universe. Look at the purples, the pinks, the reds, the blues. There's no field like it. I made this bouquet especially for you and I painted a whole hillside with it. And suddenly you hear a chorus of angels and Jesus says, they're singing your song. You are so valuable to me that the most precious and I would have entered into the agony, the pain, the suffering and the darkness of the cross if it was only to save you. He puts his hand on your shoulder and says, I don't have anyone else like you in all the universe. I made each of you special. You are a rarity. You 
are my prized possession because if I lost you, I could never replace you. Christ came to earth and poured out all of heaven for you. God's rescue is far more amazing than you can ever realize. God's plans for you are unimaginable. Is there anything or anyone that is keeping you from being ready for the coming of Christ? Right now, Jesus is preparing for you to be with him in heaven. He wants to spend eternity with you. Is it your desire to be with him forever? Do you want to surrender your life to him and follow the wonderful plans he has for your life? Friends, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask you for one thing tonight, the only thing I want, to live in your heavenly home for all of eternity and to marvel at your goodness. Lord, you know the hearts of those who are listening right now and also long to be with you in heaven. Help us to make decisions every day that lead us to you. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, amen. Friend, I invite you to interact with us in the chat or click the link below to ask a question of our online Bibles instructors. Are you comforted to know that he is coming soon to rescue you as his child, to take you home? If you'd like to make a decision to be one of his children or renew your commitment to him, just click the link below and let us know. God bless each and every one of you. I look forward to sharing tomorrow night's topic titled, The Desolation. Please join us again for Unlocking Bible Prophecies. Choose God's way. Good night, friends.